posted on our website. So, um, yeah, it was a, uh, I got a surprise on, on Sunday morning when I texted. Yeah, you know, it happened to me a couple of weeks ago too. And I, I thought for, a, you know, a millisecond that I was just run down because I'd been in and out to the city a number of times. And, and sure enough, I tested. I was like, oh, so I was sick, you know, for two days, but I had to take the five days. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll just welcome everyone and then we'll kind of get cracking. So hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Irish American Heritage Museum. Um, two nights in a row after a long summer hiatus. Um, so delighted to have you with us. Um, we have today Dr. Jean McTiernan from Scranton, Pennsylvania, who grew up in a very Irish American household. Um, he's a pediatrician, but, you know, his past story, and he'll go into this a little bit more, uh, it kind of influenced this book. So he always had this desire, you know, to tell the story, even though he's very busy as a pediatrician. Um, and so the it's his first novel which traces um, you really, you know, the coal mining, the family lives and, and leading up then to the strike in 1902. So very difficult job, of course. And, and the anthracite region was famous, you know, from the middle of the 1800s, the, the 19th century through between Molly Maguire's and all these other um, mining stories and mining disasters. Um, and it, surprisingly, a very Irish um, community, you know, people from Cork go to Oregon, they go to Butte, Montana, they go to, of course, Pennsylvania. So there are pockets of people leaving Ireland who have had mining experience at home in Ireland, whether it was in silver mines or various kind of other mines. Um, and, and they know that there are jobs aplenty in America. And, you know, sometimes it can be a great job and other times it can be pretty um, intimidating work. So those of you who are on our Zoom, you know you can go down here to the questions and answers and ask uh, or type a comment or a question. And the same on YouTube. Please feel free to go in there uh, and, and type a chat. So we're looking forward to seeing you all. And um, I, I'm looking forward to hearing the story, Dr. Martyr, and thank you for coming. Okay, so I'm going uh, to welcome. share the screen now and then we'll progress. <laughs> the You tell me, and I'm going to highlight you as the speaker. Okay. Okay. Hey, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us. And I wanted to thank yeah, Elizabeth and the, uh, the Irish American Heritage Museum for asking me to, uh, to come. Um, as as it was mentioned, I, this is uh, the first, my first attempt at writing a book. Um, not something I had really planned on when I got it, uh, started to uh, do this. It was really um, my, I, in searching through my Irish family history, I came across some things that uh, were surprising to me, and it, it interested me enough that I wanted to delve further into it. So, um, the um, oh. story I wanted to tell was I, I wanted it to be fictional. I wanted people to be able to read it, and I but I wanted to really weave a lot of Irish uh, folklore and Irish magic um, through the through the book. But I also wanted to tell the history. Um, as factually as possible. So um, the book basically starts uh, with its main character, who of course is named Patrick, um, as a breaker boy working his way up through the mines. And, and with it, you get an idea of what relationships were like, um, what the daily life was like, what the job of the various coal mining jobs were like. And, um, and it kind of leads up to the great anthracite strike of 1902. Um, so yeah, if you can go on to the next slide. Um, so in searching my family history, I came across this picture. One of uh, uh, older generation uh, family members somehow had this picture. I was just thrilled when I saw it because I, I knew nothing, almost nothing about my great grandfather, John McTiernan. And obviously he's not in his mining outfit. I think this is the classic 1800 photo picture that everyone took that uh, dressed up uh, as kind of uh, in a fancy clothing. Um, and the, the fact that I knew nothing about him, you know, really was disappointing. I thought, boy, this, I, I want to learn more. And as I researched him, I found out that he was a coal miner, and which explains probably why he ended up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And um, and I found his obituary, and, and I found out that not only was he a coal miner, but he died in a mining accident in 1897. It said in a rock fall. So I assume while he was mining that he was crushed um, or injured uh, with a um, you know, pole falling on him. Um, so I really started to dig deeper into 
not only him, but the, what mining was like and what difficult kind of job it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of let, led me into doing more research and eventually into a book. On the next slide, um, I came across his obituary. This is uh, someone copied the obituary, not the actual clipping. Um, but he, it says here that he was seriously injured, if not fatally, in the Hampton mine um, on November 11th. And he is well known throughout the Lackawanna Valley, which is the valley where a lot of the coal is and Scranton sits right in that valley. He was a member of the AOH and the CTAU, which I found out means the Catholic Total Abstinence Union. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, uh, many friends, he will be grieved here. There's a lot of misspellings. Um, and then the obituary three weeks later. So he died in what was called the Moses Taylor Hospital. It's kind of interesting because Moses Taylor was a wealthy uh, philanthropist who realized that all these miners were dying and being injured. So he actually started a hospital that was mainly geared towards the, uh, the workers of the mines in Scranton. So um, something else that I learned, uh, we, the hospital was still active when I was a child, but uh, never knew why it was called Moses Taylor. So it talks about his, he was born in County Leithrum, but they spelled it wrong. Um, probably in yeah, the that's time. Phonetically, that's how you would pronounce it. Yes, that's Most, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's so so he, uh, what was interesting, I, I got to travel there uh, in 2014, and we went to a little town called Drumahare. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, I, I assumed that was uh, probably the town he came from, just because mm -hmm. we went to the graveyard and every other tombstone had a Mc, McTiernan name on it. Uh -huh. So my guess would be uh, it's right over the border from County Sligo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's probably where he was from. And it, it member, you know, mentions again, he was a, an AOH member and a CTAU member. And what's another interesting thing that I think people will appreciate is that uh, this obituary doesn't show it. There's another one, which I couldn't dig up. I have it somewhere. Uh, he uh, had two wives. I assume probably his first wife died in childbirth, which mm -hmm. was pretty common at that time. Mm -hmm. And between the two wives and the children of the second wife, he had 23 children at the end of his life at age 50. So he was he was a pretty busy guy. Yeah. Um, and what I was really surprised is uh, that even though you know coal mining uh, pretty much ended in the 1950s in Scranton, the, the importance of it from the mid 1800s till then, it, it, you know, couldn't be under, understated. Um, but I almost knew nothing about the, the coal industry. And the the funny thing about it is, as a kid, we played in the culm dumps, which was the waste product of the uh, of the breakers. Um, we had beer parties there as teenagers because nobody went there. Um, we explored some of the mines that, you know, had damaged doors that were um, walled off. You weren't supposed to go in, but some of them were damaged. So despite being uh, extremely dangerous, we went in there at age 12, not knowing the dangers that we were getting ourselves into. Um, and on the news were things like the Centralia, the town that literally was burning. The, the mines lit fire and they had to evacuate the whole town. And uh, in the 70s, there were pipes all along the street I lived because uh, they were trying to refill the, the mines because every once in a while someone would come home from work and their house was had fallen underground, the, the mine collapsed. So the mining was everywhere, but as a kid, you, I just never really thought about it. And, uh, and then I, as I started researching it, almost all the earliest miners were uh, Irish. Mm -hmm. um, it, it timed, uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately for the, the immigrants uh, with the famine. So as they were leaving Ireland, they um, had plenty of jobs to, to settle in Scranton. So a lot of them did end up uh, in, in the area that I grew up with, uh, grew up in. Um, my great grandfather arrived around 1870 from Leitrim. And um, then that was uh, how I set up, how I became a Scrantonian. Um, next slide. So that's the cover of the book. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I was able to get, that's called the Hampton Breaker, which is actually the mine where my great-grandfather died. That's an actual picture of it. The picture's from 1905, so it was a few years after he died. Um, but that's the breaker above ground where the, the breaker boys would work and sort coal. He obviously was probably underground, which, you know, it doesn't show up in that picture. 
And Jean, uh, sorry to interrupt, but while we have this picture, are these yeah. windows, like, is this kind of a big, massive open room where they're sorting coal or are there office type things? Do you know? I, oh, I'll show you this. Um, oh, yeah. there, there's going to be a picture coming up and oh. it'll give you an idea what it looked like. They were definitely not offices. Yeah. Uh, they would, they would uh, convey the coal probably in the, the large tower to the left. Yeah. Would conveyed up in buckets on like on a conveyor belt. Yeah. Probably run by like steam engines mm -hmm. and it would dump them onto chutes and the okay. chute would run from the top of that down the, the angle to the yeah. bottom. Okay. And, and you can see one here on the outside too. Yeah. And so they were, this was a, a, a dark and dreary place in the book. I try to describe it, um, what it was like for Patrick when he started as a breaker boy, walking into this, um, you know, dark, almost like dungeon like evil kind of place. Yeah. Um, if you and if you go to the next slide, you'll see the inside of the breaker. Mm. That's what it looked like. There, the, along the chutes, were breaker boys. So, uh, and many, if if uh, many people would work their ways through the various jobs in the breaker. So the breaker is the building up above, and uh, work their way through the various jobs until they could reach the the final goal of of being an independent miner. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, some were as early as eight years of age that they started uh, and they would work, uh, some would work, you know, anywhere from one uh, or um, eight to 12 hours a day. And they'd usually work about six days a week. There were no labor laws or child labor laws at that time. And what they would have to do is sit there and as the coal rolled under them, they would have to pick out the waste, the shale mm -hmm. and, and discard it. I, I would, think they throw it overboard or, or uh, into the, uh, alongside them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the shoot boss, if you see the guy standing there with a yeah. with stick in his hand, it's usually a willow stick. He was called the shoot boss and he would walk around intimidating the boys and just whack them on the you know back or hands uh, if they were not working fast enough, if they were falling asleep, goofing around, talking, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like really the only qualification to be a shoot boss was you had to have a sadistic streak in you. I think um, yeah. that was part of the main thing. And um, so, Jean, are these tracks with the, that's kind of moving quite slowly? And these boys are sitting on these little stools almost where the thing is going under their legs to the next boy. It yeah. is. Okay. It's traveling down. Um, and there, there are several in a row because not one, you know, one boy wouldn't be able to pick it. All Catch up. everything. Yeah. They put the older and more experienced boys towards the end. Okay. Because they, you know, they were good at picking out when there's just a few left. Yeah. They were better at picking them out. The younger boys would start up top because there's plenty of things to pick. They didn't have to yeah. be so, so uh, fancy about it. And uh, interesting thing, too. So if a new boy came in, um, they would, uh, what the, the, the miners, uh, the, the breaker boys called red tops, mm -hmm. um, their fingers would get mutilated from the shale. They oh. would be cut and that was known as red tops. So a lot of the new boys would get red tops. And one of the wives tales was interesting in that um, urine was, you know, I don't know where this came from, but urine was supposed to help heal them. So many of the, the new boys would go home and soak their fingers in urine that night. And there's a, I, I, I twist that a little bit, but there's a part of my book that talks about, uh, you know, that situation um, with some of the uh, sort of bullying breaker boys to the new boys um, doing that. And um, the other thing that was interesting is a lot of these young kids would chew plugs of tobacco mm -hmm. because there was a, another wives tale about it would it would soak up the dust so they wouldn't breathe it in so much. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. Really didn't make sense. Not only were didn't it help, but they were exposed damaging to damaging themselves. Yeah. Um, mm. So, but that gives an idea. Of, imagine doing that for ten hours a day. Yeah. You just it, you just can't and imagine. like how these boys are going in there. At, did you say seven or eight years? Like how long can you last at that job when you're bent over and you yeah, know, daylight? It's a it's, uh, it's a job i think uh, you know some of these boys would do it for a year a couple of years oh. um it only a young person to do that if you you yeah. took an adult in there they would wouldn't be able to get up at the end of the shift you yeah know? um but, but even the boys don't stay at it for five or six years like it's a no, kind they, of they try yeah. to they try to move on to the next the next job and okay. work their way back you know work, work their way up 
when yeah. some of them have to pay their dues. And a lot of these Irish immigrants, you know, were scraping by. So, you know, they had to yeah. get their, you know, if they could get their boys working at eight, they would do it. Because yeah. they just simply needed the money to survive. You know, there's no other way around it. Um, and actually, while we are on that topic, no girls did this job, only boys? No. There okay. were no girls. The only thing the girls did, there were there were in another huge industry in Scranton, there was a lot of linen yeah. uh, mills. And uh, the Irish uh, people were quite good at that. So mm -hmm. uh, many of the Irish immigrants, uh, females came over um, embroidering, you know, were, you know uh, weaving. Okay. And they, would, they were easily, they could easily get jobs there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the same thing with the young girls. Uh, but that was about it. They, you know, they didn't... Uh, uh, but they had this same, yeah. miserable work uh, environment. You know, they, sure, they yeah. no unions, no labor uh, that were effective uh, labor laws. So it was a tough, a tough life for these uh, immigrants. Yeah, yeah. So the next slide, just talking about a little bit of, oh. you know, one of the there's a Shakespeare saying in Hamlet that said, you know, once a man, twice a boy, mm -hmm. referring to, um, you know, when you get old, you you may become senile and you kind of return to being a boy. The miners used to talk about it as once a man, twice a boy, because some some of these miners were so broken by the, you know, they're in their 20s and 30s that they couldn't do any other job. You know, their joints were broken, they'd been injured, their lungs were giving out because of black lung, that they literally, the only job they could do anymore is go back to the breaker um, because they, and it was tough because, you know, the pay was terrible, but sometimes they needed that money. So. Yeah. The miners kind of twisted it into meaning, you know, the, the mine broke you and you're, you're, you're sort of a breaker boy again. It's it, it's kind of an interesting way that they twisted it. Some of the dark Irish humor, I think, you know, it was <laughs> very typical of, yeah. of miners. Uh, and the breaker boys, the wrist, you know, uh, some of them fell, you know, uh, from the breaker. Uh, they got caught in machinery. They got mangled. Um, they would usually have a you know if they if they died and plenty of boys died in, in the breaker um long before they could get black lung you know um mm -hmm. and it, the break and the breaker boy wasn't uh labor laws weren't changed until the 1930s so even in the 1902 big strike they didn't get any child labor laws out of it um and at that point it's probably because they developed automated coal picking a way to separate the shale so mm -hmm. the coal miner the, the coal barons could you know, didn't have to pay anyone anymore. They could just use the free machinery. The machinery, yeah. It probably wasn't out of the goodness of their heart. It was probably more like, hey, I can make a few more bucks kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, next slide. So the, the, the and uh, in, in my book, I, I take Patrick through all of these different jobs. I just thought it would be nice to give sort of the, the background and you'd see a lot of this, but it, it, I try to give it a more personal touch because Patrick is actually doing these jobs and you see you know, what his day is like. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a, a trapper or a door boy. They're uh, referred to as both. And the thing that's misleading about this picture is you can see him, it's it's fairly bright. The, obviously the photographer had some kind of flash or something. It would be normally pitch black. You couldn't see the hand in front of your face. Uh, the kids would have a, a helmet with a lamp, but probably didn't keep it lit all the time because you know, fuel was expensive and it would run out and uh, they would probably use it conservatively, maybe mm -hmm. when they were eating lunch or when they're first getting there. Um, so they would sit in this total darkness for eight to 10 or 12 hours a day. And their job was to open and close that door. Mm -hmm. um, some of the doors were wooden. Some of them were pretty heavy steel or iron. And the reason they had to do it, the, the fire boss was in charge of keeping ventilation in the mine. So toxic gases or explosive gases didn't uh, um, accumulate. Mm -hmm. And to do that, they needed, the ventilation was critical and they had to guide the air in certain ways. So the doors were helped to help guide the air. That's why they were very, very important. Um, the fire boss would be in charge. Some days he might say this door needs to be open, that door needs to be closed, or all doors need to be closed. But the door boy, so he had to respond to that. But more importantly, as a coal car came, he had to open it for them. Mm. So if the cool car was coming from his side, that's not a big deal. But sometimes it came from the other side. And if a child wasn't paying attention or if he was sleeping mm -hmm. uh, and that cool car hit that door, it would swing open. And, and the most common way that trappers 
uh, were injured or killed was that door, you know, just flying open and crushing them. Um, so they had a, you know, you, you think of like, you know, a 10 year old being awake for 10 hours in the, you know, by himself down in a mine. And literally. in the dark, you know, where it's and you're the pitch black, <laughs> yeah. having to keep an attention span. Yeah. Uh, just amazing that that any of them uh, survived at all. Yeah. And I just looking at the door there, it, it looks like it says up there, please don't scare the birds. And there's pictures of birds. Were they still using birds? I mean, we hear about it in Wales, you know, with the canary and the gases. Did they use birds, do you think, to detect poison gas or? Uh, you know, I. I, I I've heard that story many times, and I and I looked <laughs> in my research, I couldn't find it. The, oh. In the book, I uh, I refer to what they did use were rats. Mm. Um, the rats were their miners' friends. Uh, <laughs> the Irish uh, uh, miners th- had a you know always felt like the the um, rats down below were cleaner than the ones up above. I don't know where that mm-hmm. came from. Mm. Uh, and when the rats uh, started to run, the miners would would run after them uh, oh. because the, they could uh, sense, you know, a collapse coming, mm-hmm. you know, maybe vibrations in the in the earth or um, gases or f- so. There was a lot of research in Scran about rats. Mm. Um, so the rats were almost like the canary in the coal mine. That, okay. that about. yeah. So it's interesting, you know. I I, I don't know if that was. I, I'd love to hear that. I'd love to know the story of that. Of who, yeah. And uh, I mean, this might have been added later on, that graffiti. We don't know, maybe, you know, but it just is interesting. Please don't scare the birds. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. So mm-hmm. whether it was just a, a little Irish humor or yeah. actual meaning, it's kind of hard. Yeah. To and of course, there are no birds underneath, you know, in the dark. So, yeah, it could be being facetious as well. Mm-hmm. OK, next slide. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the boys that uh, survived. Uh, being a trapper would move on to being a spragger. Mm-hmm. This is a word that probably not many people have heard of. It uh, A sprag is a, a short, stout metal or wooden rod. And what the, the spragger would do, they'd have to be older boys because they had to be quick and they had to be strong. They would either sit on the coal cars or they would run along the coal car to throw switches, to turn them. But more, most importantly, when there was a downhill, they had to slow that car down because if it got going too fast, you know, it could, could jump the tracks, it could really cause damage. Mm-hmm. So they would take the sprag, and if you go to the next slide, you can see pictures of, these are kind of fancier than I think the Irish people were using in Scranton at the time, but it gives you an idea of what it is. Mm-hmm. So if you think of a, a train car wheel, but spoked, not solid metal, they would have to stick that into the spoke mm. to lock the wheel, to stop it, slow it down, and then they'd pull it out run alongside it, jam it in again. So you can imagine if that car got going so fast that, you know, those spokes almost form a solid object, uh, it would be really hard to get it into them. So they had to be really knowledgeable and careful uh, Mm -hmm. what to do. And if they got it going too fast, you know, the the spraggers would frequently, um, you know, many of them were injured by, you know, falling, you know, or, you know, losing their balance or, you know, not being able to stop the car and it tipping on them. So um, I talk about Patrick's, uh, uh, you know, his time as a spragger and some of the um, injuries that were that he saw around him. He, he was not. But um, so that that was another uh, pretty dangerous job. The next picture shows some of the boys that are spraggers. So you can see mm-hmm. the fancy metal and, and cane like spraggers are nothing like what they're holding. They look like they're holding, you know, just pieces of birch tree or something. Yeah. Um, and which would make more sense, you know, cause they didn't have money to buy anything. They'd probably just go out in the woods and uh, carve it or have their dad carve it for them. And you can see there's one sitting up to the left um, and you can see how it's pointed. Yeah. So you know, that would make it, uh, the boys are holding the points on the other one. Yeah. So that that would make it easier to get in, you know, like uh, into the into the spokes. Right. And uh, so that that's probably uh, you know maybe some of the there's an older guy in the back or two, but the other ones are you can see they're older boys because again they needed a little bit more uh, intelligence, strength, and stamina to be able to do this job. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and then the next. Uh, uh, you know, then the, the kids would move up to uh, a mule boy. 
Um, the Mule Boys were, um, <clears throat> Patrick has a mule called Dolores in the book uh -huh. uh, that he becomes, he becomes friends with him. And uh, Dolores is a great story. Um, he, the, the Mule Boys, uh, their job was to take care of that mule in addition to driving the mule. Hmm. So the, the mules were very helpful when there was flat areas of the mine where they couldn't use gravity in rail cars and they actually had to pull the coal you know, along a flat area. And to save money, the coal barons always were looking to save a few bucks. They kept the mules in the mine because if they stabled them outside of the mine, they won't have to pay for the stable. And then in the, the mine, they didn't have to pay anybody and they still had to feed them, of course. Mm -hmm. So the mule boy would have to show up early, you know, brush down his mule, feed, feed his mule, check his mule, make sure everything was okay. The mule wasn't ill or sick or injured. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and the sad part about it is, you know, many of these mules lived in the mine, never saw the sun and died in the mine. And uh, it, it really was uh, a pretty miserable experience. But the 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 mule the the uh, miners just love the mules you know it was like their pet or their um, you know they and the mule boys usually bonded quite mm -hmm. quite strongly with their with their mule and mm -hmm. took pride in taking care of it and uh, you know for the coal barons the <clears throat> the mule was a lot more uh, valuable than a worker mm -hmm. because one they had to buy a mule that you know cost a significant amount of money at that time and uh, Whereas, you know, workers were paid peanuts and they were a dime a dozen. If one got killed, you could find five to replace them. So mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, the, the mule was probably more valuable than the humans that worked in the mines. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, the, the mules or the mule boys. Uh, and you can see that they, they had some time to have some fun. Here's a mule that- Right, yeah, I was thinking- Actually outside, so, yeah. uh, you know, one of the few mules that, you know, gets out and sees the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the next slide is the, uh, <clears throat> you know, then right. the next step would be, uh, you know, the, uh, the, they, they would become an apprentice to a, a licensed miner hmm. for a, a year or two and uh, learn how to set charges, how to, you know, look for veins, how to collect the coal, how to, you know, load the coal. Mm -hmm. And eventually they became an independent mine. The reason they're called independent is they weren't paid for by the mine. They were paid by the carload of coal. So each time they, they, had, they would sit down and contract with the, the coal mine owner to how much he would pay per carload. Mm -hmm. And once the miner uh, got uh, filled a carload or two, or he felt like he, he did enough, he would leave. So the miner sometimes left you know, work early and probably worked the least hours of almost anyone in the mine. Mm -hmm. uh, one big issue, the inspector, when they, the coal car, as it was about ready to go up the conveyor belt onto into the breaker, an inspector would look that was paid for by the mine owner and he would look over the coal and uh, he'd say, oh no, that one's not full enough or there's too much shale in there. And then they would you know, reduce the price to pay. Mm -hmm. So that was one other way that they uh, stole wages you know, from the miner. And mm -hmm. there were a couple of strikes in the Scranton area, not directly in Scranton, where they, um, that was one of the sort of a, the bone of contention over um, some of these strikes was that, you know, they, the miners had had enough getting, you know, sort of cheated out of their, out of their pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was why, you know, they were called independent because they really were like, almost like a contract worker. They weren't paid a salary by the mine. They were paid by mm -hmm. the mine. And, uh, so Patrick uh, runs it to, has a very interesting apprenticeship in the book. He, um, uh, it, it's a, a little bit of Irish uh, folklore uh, <laughs> thrown in there. It's, um, it, it's um, he is a, uh, an interesting character. Let me, let me just say that, that teaches him, but good at what he did. And mm -hmm. uh, Patrick, Patrick uh, learned a lot from him. Hmm. And, and then, um, can I ask you, like, would they be filling kind of nine or ten car loads a day? You know, like, how long did it take to, I guess, if you're blasting something and you're just scooping it up and putting it in, you know, that mightn't take that long. Right. It uh, it depends. Um, mm -hmm. They would uh, probably would do uh, maybe several cars after, you know, they had done a blast 
Right. Probably not nine or 10. It was probably less than that. And because you've got to go up and down too. So all of that takes time. Uh, there was, uh, they have to, you know, they had a little uh, smaller cart that they would fill in the, in the, the breast that they were working and mm -hmm. they would travel it over. And then the, uh, the spragger or the mule boy, depending on what was being used in that area of the mine, would help them transfer it from the little car to the big coal car. And he'd wait there. And the apprentice did a lot of the work, you know, okay. plugging coal. Um, yeah. And they would fill that up. And once it was full, then the mule boy or the spragger would take the coal cart, you know, on its path. Right. And then bring an empty one back. And then they would work on filling it again. Um, there was a lot of things that I mentioned in my book, too. There's uh, dead work, mm -hmm. it, it, what was needed. So dead work was really important, but the problem with dead work was that um, you, you weren't filling a coal car, so you really weren't getting paid for it. But dead work was, you know, putting timbers up to mm -hmm. prevent the mine from collapsing, yeah. uh, cleaning out debris, anything that, you know, wasn't productive. Um, but it's still essential sort of like to the operation, cool. yeah. And you so, don't get paid for that, yeah. So a lot of times the, the way the, the coal miners or the coal owners, uh, the coal barons would um, uh, manipulate the market. If there was a glut of coal, they would mm. close down for uh, some, a few days or a week. Mm. So that way, you know, the supply and demand, they'd cut down the supply. So the prices went up. So the miners really tried to get their dead work done when the mine was closed. Okay. So it, it just, you know, they, they weren't wasting time when the mine was open, then they could get, make money. Mm -hmm. uh, if they had to do dead work when the mine was open, you know, everyone else is making money and they're not because they're putting yeah. the timbers. And the, the, the mine by law had to supply the timbers. Um, the miner pretty much supplied everything else. Like he had to buy his own, you know, dynamite or uh, black powder uh, tools and everything. So it was, uh, it was wow. interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. It's like teachers today buying their own supplies. <laughs> but I mean, yes. you know, yeah. wow. And they, uh, some, some of the things that, you know, I think that the, uh, yeah, you can go to that next slide. Mm -hmm. The uh, injustices, and I tried to weave them into my book, um, you know, the company store, uh, yeah. it's, you know, the miners might have been making enough money to get by on, but, you know, most of the other people were not. Yeah. Um, so uh, they would allow them to buy on credit, but the prices were inflated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they would get into debt. And then, you know, when a payday came, you know, most of their check was gone back to the mine bus. Yeah. They would take it before they handed it to you. Yeah. And it really kept them indebted to the company store, to the mine. And it kind of trapped They've them. They've been doing the that during the canal building and the railroads, you know, that's yeah. the operating. Yeah. It was, uh, it, it was rampant throughout. And same thing with company housing. They, you know, yeah. these minor, you know, very, you know, uh, minimalistic uh, houses that were, you know, more like shacks. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, I came across in the reading, if, if a miner died, the widow had 30 days to pack up and get out of there. Wow. Um, so a lot of these, the, um, uh, you know, widows would sometimes have to quick, you know, find a, a, a widower that they could marry uh, wow. just so they could keep their families fed and housed. Otherwise they had, a lot of times they were, you know, stayed at home taking care of the, the house the family the kids mm -hmm. and uh, didn't have really a job and suddenly their income was just taken completely away from them mm -hmm. so it was a really tough situation they'd rely on some charity try to get by um for a little while but that was that was tough these guys didn't you know the irish immigrants didn't love to take charity they didn't like to be a bother and um but they would come up with uh, other ways. And if they had enough kids, uh, you know, the kids working might be able to keep them, keep them going. But mm -hmm. unless they had a lot of kids working, sometimes it was a pretty sad story for the, the widower of a, of a mine. Yeah. And uh, the next thing I put down is <coughs> Black Maria. Uh, there's a little mention of this in the book. I don't know if, <coughs> if anyone's ever heard that term. Have mm -hmm. you? I have, ever? yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Black Maria was a horse-drawn carriage yeah. that was the basically the carried the coffin or the body, I should say, not a coffin, uh, carried the body of a dead miner back mm -hmm. to the house. And uh, some of the stories, I mean, they would literally sometimes drop the body on the porch and then just keep, and keep going. Wow. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, sorry for your loss kind of stuff going mm -hmm. on. And uh, 
when there, you know, there was a, a siren system at almost all the mines, and probably nothing was more terrifying to the Irish people than hearing that siren go, go off, because it meant there was a serious accident at the mine. Mm-hmm. And families would usually drop whatever they're doing and, and run toward the mine. And you could just imagine the picture of all these women and children standing around the entrance of a mine, mm-hmm. waiting, and waiting to see what the news was, who was going to come up out of the mine. And um, it was just wow. just a traumatic experience, I'm sure, for them. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially when you know your sons are going into it or might already be in there, too. You know, there's very little hope sort of in the community. Mm-hmm. And this is uh, I couldn't resist putting this guy's picture in there. He is my certified miner. If you make it through all that and you're still alive, that's what you end up. You got your lunch pail on your hat. <laughs> yeah. And he just looks like he's uh, he's made it to the top. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not, I'm not sure what the story is on that picture, but he uh, he seems pretty happy to be dressed up like a miner. Yeah, I'm hoping it is a costume. You know. To, yeah. to make... uh, but th- those. I mean, this is probably a stupid question, but the the hats, the the miner lamp, was it like kerosene on their head or was it just a candle? How were they a candle and a mirror? You know, is there actual fuel? Yeah, there is. Um, so what's interesting is um, I, uh, I learned a lot about this and, and yeah. I, I mentioned it. I mentioned it in the book, you know, I talk about the fire boss, Mr. Hayes, oh. and he is um, he's a. Uh, you know, his job is to get there early and inspect the mines, check for gases and make sure it's safe before mm-hmm. going down. And uh, what prior to them having safety lamps, there were that was a bad combination. You have an f- open flame and potentially methane gas. Wow. So there was a lot of explosions. And it, what was invented around the time. So my book, they had safety lamps. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure I understand completely how they work, but there was some kind of cloth. Uh, if you think of like a modern propane lamp, you know how the mm-hmm. cloth is what like lights up. And the cloth would prevent the gas from exposing, uh, being exposed to the open the flame. flame. Yeah. But they were oil lamps or kerosene or some fuel Gee. that was on their head. And what would happen is if they ran into a methane, yeah. It wouldn't ignite the methane, but it, the, the, the light would glow a lot brighter. Okay. So Fireball. So that was a warning, too, maybe to get out. Yeah. He would walk around, and uh, if he saw that light glowing bright, <laughs> the methane was there. If, it, if they ran into carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, white damp and, and black damp, then the light would go out. Mm-hmm. So if the light went out, that he also knew. But it, it, the safety lamp was a huge, uh, simple invention that probably saved countless uh, yeah. miners from, you know, uh, mine explosions and collapse and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there, there was a lot of uh, just uh, the amount of death uh, in, the, in the coal mines around Scranton were uh, just phenomenal the more I researched it. You know. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, so yeah let i'll just stop sharing let me look at that so we are going to have some copies of the book come in yes. uh, it is available on amazon of course but um you know we we'll get some copies we hope and um but uh gene to go back to you know talking about the whole um minor you know so there's obviously hundreds if not thousands of people working here because you've got the young boys and then they age out and go to the next system of course some of them you know if you lose your hand or or half a foot you can't work you know but but there must be thousands of people working in these mines oh there were thousands there were yeah. you know, i show you a picture of that hampton breaker yeah there were, there were probably over a hundred breakers around just scranton and if wow. you go down that valley where the anthracite was yeah you know there you know i don't know the full number but it had to be several hundred breakers all employing. Uh, yeah. And um, not to mention each, the railroad. Uh, I do talk about the railroads. Railroads were big because mining and the and, uh, rail industry were hand in hand, you know, that's yeah. how it's to New York and, and other places. Um, so there's a, a character, Sully, who's a, uh, he's a railroad guy and he, but he also is uh, imp- instrumental in, in when they start trying to organize in the unions. And the immigrants, you know, the Irish were the original ones, but what happened is as the Irish became more organized and un- trying to unionize, the cold barons didn't like that. 
Yeah. So they, they tried to tap into the Eastern Europeans and, and Italians. Mm -hmm. So if you go and they would bring them in because they were struggling and starting out just like the Irish yeah. did you know, 10, 20 years before that. Yeah. And they would and take so they would scab each other. Yeah. They, they tried to turn the workers on each other. So yeah. one of the things that was fantastic about the 1902 strike, and I, I dealt a lot of that in the book is Patrick and his, his uh, friends and family that are part of the or, or union leaders mm -hmm. reaching out to those communities, to the, uh, you know, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, mm -hmm. um, uh, Polish, Italians mm -hmm. to say, hey, you know, we got to work together. You know, we're all different, but we got to work mm -hmm. together. And, uh, and it was because of that, you know, they all had that solidarity did work like yeah. it, it, yeah. it worked. And, you know, uh, 1902 strike is considered a success by some. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Jones, I uh, considered, uh, uh, who is a uh, one of my heroes. Um, yeah, she loved her mining boys. <laughs> she called them her boys. She yeah. wanted to fight harder and longer. Mm -hmm. But John Mitchell was sort of the connected politician type, and he, mm -hmm. he took what he got. And uh, Mother Jones was not happy with him. So, mm -hmm. and Mother Jones, another uh, from uh, County Cork. And, and, yeah, yeah. And she continues, like she goes on with the, the miners in West Virginia in 1912. You know, she doesn't quit. Until, yeah. until the day she died, she just went yeah. from mining uh, strikers, uh, it, whether it be textile, railroad. Yeah. And the children, too. That was a big concern for her kids working in any industry. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting, like, though, that the mining barons or whoever they are, you know, like when you look at the the Avondale disaster that had happened a couple of years or maybe 20 or 30 years earlier than your book. And, you know, the Knights of Labour are practically wiped out. The Molly Maguires aren't successful. There's just this like, oh, you know, monopoly that you cannot get past the mining, the, the guys who own the mines, whether it's Frick or, you know, um, I can't remember your man's name. The Scottish lad, Carnegie, you know, owns so many of these mines. And Carnegie does so much good in terms of, he, in, even in Ireland, like he donated money in Ireland to open libraries, but, you know, exactly. treats his workers like dogs, you know, and, and very much pit one group against the other. I can't remember the name of the book. I used to teach a novel at Fordham University that talked about um, pitting, you know, the Irish against the Eastern Europeans, Polish, especially in the, and, you know, as you say, they were used to break each other's strikes and the language barrier was an issue. And, you know, and sometimes the Irish were maybe in a supervisory role, you know, either in the union or in the mine. And so they didn't allow the other group to kind of come as far as they had come, you know, so you're jealously guarding the little bit that you have, you know, instead of being in solidarity with the other workers. Yeah, yeah. And that's what is interesting, you know, they, I, people are referring to this, uh, summer, the summer of uh, union organizing, like there's so many successful union organizing going on this mm -hmm. year. And, you know, that's 120 years ago since the, the great strike. And yeah. you know, workers are still fighting, you know, mm -hmm. still trying to struggle to, to mm -hmm. get a fair, a fair deal. But it, it's been very encouraging to see the successes the unions are having right now. Mm, yeah, and they have had a resurgence too. Like we, there was a, a very successful, you know, anti-union PR campaign right from the start. You know, it kind of absolutely came to, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s. Like some people have a very bad opinion of unions, you know, and yeah. even though, of course, you know, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. So even if you're not in the union, you benefit, you know, from improved conditions or wages, you know. Uh, Irish you, very pro union. So, <laughs> one thing that you uh, mentioned the Avondale uh, mine disaster. I think it's the uh, Avondale in, in in the book. It, what's interesting is there's an old uh, cemetery um, that in that was very next close to this Hampton Breaker. It was one of the original cemeteries in Scranton. There's also a Catholic cemetery, but that was um, I referenced that later in the book. Um, but Patrick and his father who's uh, the O'Neill, walks through the cemetery uh, on the way to the breaker. And it's the only patch of green in the entire area. Everything else is covered in coal dust, is dead, is black. It's very dark and dreary. But when they walk into that, you know, because everyone respected that area, they wouldn't cut down trees for firewood because it was in a, you know, it was superstition a little bit. Yeah, but, yeah. it. but as he walks through, he starts to wander and Patrick is, curious because he's like my dad never wanders he's a like get it done kind of guy yeah. and he the reason he wandered 69 of the people killed in the Avondale disaster are buried literally in that 
the cemetery. So in the book I have him, he, he would always go and kind of walk through their area of gravestone to pay the, his respects before he went on to yeah. work. And kind of for luck, you know, hopefully I won't be joining you. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, like the Irish, I think, are a little bit morbid <laughs> with death, you know. <laughs> he said the only time, uh, the only time uh, you get to experience color is, you know, after you've passed, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, everything's black and white because, of, you know, the coal and the coal the dust. Coal dust, yeah. And so in your own family, Jean, you were saying, like, was it your great-grandfather? Great-grandfather. Yeah, it was. And here you are today, a pediatrician, you know, so like the upward mobility within two or three generations is obviously very quick, you know. So was your grand great-grandfather the only minor or did his children also go? I know he had 85 or whatever, 16 kids, you know, but yeah. His, uh, the, my, gra- my grandfather was John McTiernan also. So mm-hmm. um, somehow I think he ran out of names and he had to start yeah. using Oh yeah, they recycled uh, the names. <laughs> yeah. he, um, he, uh, he died when he was 50, but he had died of a, a intestinal like uh, ulcer that bled. Oh yeah. So he died before I was born. Okay, your old granddad. Yeah. I my granddad. My dad got married very early. He was 45 when he got married. So I was like a generation off from typical. Yeah, yeah. They never really talked a lot about him, and mm-hmm. in the research I have, I haven't been able to find much of anything about him. But I have a feeling he was in the mines. Yeah. Um, so he he was in the mines, and then my dad was just a blue collar, like um, yeah. you know, when it was in World War II, and kind of a you know blue collar job, machinist. Yeah. He's a janitor. He was you know a variety of different jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, but not, that picture you know with him in a suit and everything, and being in the AOH, you know, he probably wasn't just a minor. You know, like he might have been a little bit more senior, or yeah. you know, as as you said, the miners themselves were kind of contracted, so maybe he was you know, a very good miner that earned, a, you know, a decent money because he was able and to, I, you know, properly. Yeah. I assume he, you know, he, he came over here in 1870. So he was born, mm. I think, in 1847. Gee, so during the famine. it was like, yeah, yeah. He was born during the famine. Mm-hmm. And it was 20. So he was early 20. So my guess is he must have had some mining experience to jump yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah, um, but I, I have not. And there would be mines, I'd say, up around Leitrim and Sligo. I'm trying to think now. My, you know, I know where the famous ones are in Cork, like and down in the silver mines in Tipperary. I think there are mines up around <laughs> Sligo area too. And Leitrim is, you know, a kind of a poor county. Like there's a lot of immigration out of Leitrim, yeah. you know. So yeah, because there isn't a whole pile of industry or employment at home there. It's a very so it isn't good. You know, the farming isn't good there. Yeah. One of the, the probably one of the most rural. Um, you know, I guess out west, there's probably some too. But yeah, but that's right. Like there aren't big towns, or you know, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I follow the Leitrim football team, so. Oh, you do um, good. Yeah, well, I'm a carry woman, yeah. so <laughs> nothing <laughs> exists, you know, past <laughs> past Galway for us. <laughs> yeah, I got to see them play in New York City uh, a few months ago. Oh, good. Cool. That's right. Yeah. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, you should jump in. Yeah. I better check uh, YouTube. I mean, I have plenty of questions, so I'll keep <laughs> asking, but um, where did my YouTube go? Oh, here it is. Good. Uh, I just want to make sure nobody is asking me anything here. Um, no. Okay. Um, and so when did the mines close, did you say, in Scranton? There was a major disaster in like the 1950s. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, the, the uh, coal barons thought they could get a few extra dollars out of the mines. Mm-hmm. So they thought, you know, when they, they were mining, they would leave instead of timber, sometimes they would leave a pillar of coal oh. as, a, as a timber. Oh, and my God. The engineers would say, you know, it needs to be 10 feet wide or whatever. You know, they yeah. would figure it out mathematically. The coal barons are like, ah, eight feet's probably enough. Yeah. So they would ship away at the the columns yeah and sure enough they got they were right near the um the uh i don't know if it was the river it would be the susquehanna river in, mm-hmm. in the wilkesbury area and they um did, you know uh trimmed them down so much that it collapsed and the river just filled the mine it was just yeah. horrendous loss of life oh, and that was pretty, they, they pretty much tapped out the mines and um mm-hmm. And they were just trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel, kind of. And yeah, yeah. Lost a lot of lives, you know, for a oh, few. Absolutely, months. yeah, yeah, for a few dollars. Well, so um, it much ended at that point. Uh, no one had the. It, it wasn't worth investigating. They'd cleaned it out, and they yeah, 
And they wouldn't have invested in it to improve it, you know, even if there was another kind of vein there. Yeah. We grew up absolutely adoring that movie, How Green Was My Valley, um, which is obviously Welsh. I don't know if any of you watched it. It's an old black and white movie with Maureen O'Hara playing a Welsh girl. And um, I forget who Roddy McDowell is in there, but I forget who was the kind of the husband fellow. But she marries in. She's from a little mining village and marries into the owner's family because she was so beautiful, you know. But her dad, I loved her dad. Um, oh, I forget his name. Crisp, it might be something crisp. He, he played the father in a lot of things. He was the father in National Velvet, you know, in all these movies. Uh, Donald Crisp, I think is his name. And he he's stuck in the mine. And as you said, you know, like all the village runs, then the mom and they're out there and, you know, it's one son is lifted out, but somebody else is stuck. It's absolutely horrific, you know. Um, such a sad, sad film. So um, your novel, people should buy it. Wait for us to get copies or else buy it on Amazon. Um, it is fictional, but very heavily researched as we've seen tonight, you know. And so, and I love that you're saying you're interweaving maybe some of the Irish stories or the Irish folklore that this group- There's a, yeah, each other. Irish, uh, there's a little bit about, you know, Druid uh, funeral kind of stuff. There's some- um, uh, magic there's some you know the ghost stories and things education the, you yeah. know the, so it's it's a very fun story patrick is the main character but he's got a pretty impressive father and uh him and his sister molly are typical uh siblings mm -hmm. and uh is you know just his day-to-day -day life you know what it's like um going to work living there uh the various jobs so you learn about the jobs as mm -hmm. you follow patrick you know on his on his journey mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and obviously it, he's not going to school because he's working from the time he's seven or eight right but his, yeah. his dad put education as a uh, priority so he, oh. he has a jesuit who oh. uh, teaches him he okay. spends the time teaching him about uh, irish uh you know irish uh, history and irish uh folk stuff but when it you know it gets to a certain age he he makes patrick go several yeah. nights a week to the jesuit who can teach him you know math and science yeah, and, and reading mm -hmm. yeah. oh that's great and were any of them involved in the union movement or the labor movement in your book oh yeah that's uh that's patrick, the big... <laughs> yeah, patrick, patrick's father the o'neill was like the elder of the community in a okay. way okay um, Patrick eventually takes that, you know, over, uh, and along with his sister, there's a lot of empowered females in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick's uh, eventual girlfriend um, is quite a really strong character. She, I love her. She's one of my favorite characters in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the other one is his sister Molly, and they <clears throat> they work in the the textile place. So mm -hmm. they they uh, but they're they become leading the union meetings. Uh, Molly becomes good friends with Mother uh, Jones and oh. gets her to come to Scranton yeah. and motivate the people. Uh, they come up with some, you know, symbolic stuff to help motivate people and yeah. help, you know, get all the communities organized and even have a um, demonstration like a, a march in Scranton. Uh, that, you know, that didn't really happen, but Mother Jones probably had been to Scranton, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Even if it was just to pass through, you know, yeah. And I, but I, I make her, you know, being there, become friends with Molly. Molly and her become, you know, friends. And oh, that's uh, great. Well, I we're I, we're fascinated with Mother Jones. We've had a number of talks that kind of feature her, and you know, the most dangerous woman in America, and she looks like yeah. Mother Santa Claus, you know, <laughs> Mrs. Claus. Uh, you wouldn't want to cross her path. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. On, on the wrong side of her, she absolutely was... not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as you wouldn't with most Irish women. <laughs> <laughs> there's no doubt about it yeah so thank you so much um we don't have any questions so i i won't um keep people up but uh i wanted to just thank you so much for coming with us tonight and to remind you guys that our next event is uh in person we're saturday october 21st at seven o'clock we've got more any kahasig and chris newman um virtuoso harp and guitar duo they'll do a lot of irish traditional stuff and some kind of contemporary jazz then on Thursday, October 26th at 5.30 p.m., we've got Bram Stoker's Dublin, um, or Dracula's Dublin, maybe, with Dr. Um, Kinneen from Trinity College Dublin. And on the 29th, which is a Sunday, that whole weekend, we'll have, you know, trick-or-treating at the museum and some crafts for Halloween. But at 2 o'clock on Sunday, um, we'll have a local author, Lisa LaMonica, who will talk about her book, Witches and Warlocks of New York. 
And then we're back on Monday the 30th. We didn't want to push our luck too much and actually do it on Halloween night because we ought to be safely indoors. But on October 30th, we've got our Halloween film club, You Are Not My Mother. And that's based on, it's a modern kind of, uh, I would say spooky. It's not gory or horror, you know, filled or anything, but it's based on the changeling myth, the, the traditional changeling myth. And of course, in our museum at the moment, we have the Great Hunger Collection on loan to us from Quinnipiac. And we've written a new exhibition about the Great Hunger and the famine. And we also have our Samhain and the Origins of Halloween exhibit up. And there's loads of little creepy uh, ghost stories and famous hauntings in Ireland that you can learn about down in the museum. So thank you very much, Dr. McTiernan. We're delighted to have you and hope to have you at, in person at some stage. And if you write a second book, call us. <laughs> I'm working on it about halfway through. So. Oh, you are? About the same kind of family? It's, or? A, it's a prequel. Um, oh, when, yeah. You know, Patrick's father's known as the O'Neill. That's all at any one so I left oh, that as a very yeah. big question, like, why? Why is he called yeah. that? And uh, the prequel kind of goes into the that. history okay. of that and what led him up to coming to Scranton eventually. Okay, great, great. Well, that's good. Most of that's going to take place in Ireland and England. Yeah, right. Okay, until he immigrates. That's great. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Feel better soon. But I'm so glad we were able to still do this tonight, even though it's not in person. So yes, we owe you again. And I will, I will stop by. I'll, I'll bring some books. Good. Yeah, yeah. I would love that. Okay. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank okay. you so much. Good night. For Thank you.